let us wake up. Not just from the Sunday morning exhaustion or from the wish for a few more drowsy minutes in bed. Let us wake up to this world we live in, to its beauty and wonder and to its tragedy and pain. We must wake up to the idea that our wholeness, our lives are only as complete as the lives of those around us, of those we are tied to in a great web of mutuality of which we are a part. We must stay woke, in the words of Black Lives Matter activists working every day for racial justice in our country. Let us wake up. Let us stay awake. Let us stay woke. And now, in this time and place, let us worship together. We begin by lighting the flame on our chalice. Blessed is the fire that burns deep in the soul. It is the flame of the human spirit touched into being by the mystery of life. It is the fire of reason, the fire of compassion, the fire of community, the fire of justice, the fire of faith. It is the fire of love burning deep in the human heart the divine glow in every life. Welcome to online worship at the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos. I'm Ann Marsh, worship associate. Our minister, the Reverend John Cullinan, is Zooming with Las Cruces you use today, and I'm delighted to welcome our guest minister, the Reverend Suzanne Redfern Campbell. Sue retired from active ministry in 2018, having served Unitarian Universalist congregations since 1985. Most recently, she was developmental minister in Las Cruces for five years. Sue grew up Methodist, but became a UU in her 20s when she moved to Boston and discovered the historic Arlington Street Church. After a career change from law, Sue served churches in six states and one Canadian province. 
She found assisting congregations in transition especially meaningful and became an accredited interim minister. Sue came to New Mexico after marrying her late husband, Chuck Campbell, on New Year's Day in 2012. She lives in Albuquerque now with a mellow orange tabby cat named Sunny and enjoys reading, gardening, and cooking. Welcome, Sue. As Unitarian Universalists, we come together not because we all believe the same things, but to learn from each other, to draw inspiration from many sources, and to work together to build communities of greater justice and compassion. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on your journey, you are welcome here. If you're watching on Sunday morning, we invite you to join our Zoom coffee hour after the service at 11. For other opportunities to connect online during the week, check our Facebook page, website, and email announcements. Whether you're visiting us for the first time or have been part of this congregation for years, we hope that this time that we set apart from our everyday concerns will help us to see the holy in ourselves, in each other, and in the world around us. Let us begin with a moment of shared silence. From the events of our lives come the songs of our hearts. Some are heart songs of grief and sorrow, some of joy and hope, whether spoken aloud, written down, whispered into the wind, or held in silence, all are a precious part of the journey we share. So let us take a moment now as two candles burn in our sanctuary, to bring to our minds and hearts whatever joys and sorrows we carry with us this day. In the midst of national trauma and personal struggles, anxiety, anger, fear, grief are all too real, and yet, a hawk over the canyon, moonlight through the pines, a cup of tea with a friend, even if it's over Zoom. All these can remind us that love and beauty are as real as pain and loss. Sources of healing and wholeness abound. And there is a love that will not let us go. Let us pray. Spirit of life, who draws us together in a web of holy relationships, make your presence known with us and in us and among us. Remind us that we are not alone. Remind us that we are not alone in history. Ignite us with the courage of the living tradition. Remind us that we are not alone in entering the future. Anchor us with patience and perseverance. Remind us that we are not alone in our times of grief and pain. Comfort us with your spirit, manifest in human hands and voices. Remind us that we are not alone in joy and wonder. Inspire us to honor and extend the beauty we find in this world. 
divine music of the universe. Let our hearts beat in diverse and harmonious rhythms, cooperating with an everlasting dance of love. May we move with the rhythms of peace. May we move with the rhythms of compassion. May we move with the rhythms of justice. Source of stars and planets and water and land, open our hearts to all of our neighbors. Open our souls to a renewal of faith. Open our hands to join together in the work ahead. So be it. Blessed be. Amen. There is more love somewhere. There is more love somewhere. I'm gonna keep on till I I'd like to tell you a story from my own life. It's about a walk I took on a lovely June night some years ago. I was living in Canada at the time in the beautiful city of Vancouver, and I was on a spiritual retreat with a bunch of other people. Part of the retreat was to spend a whole day, 24 hours in silence, not talking. Can you imagine that? not talking for a whole 24 hours? Well, I couldn't imagine it either. But the retreat leader, whose name was Don, told us not to be afraid of it. He said, think of the silence as a gift. Go anywhere you want, do anything you want, just do it silently. Well, okay, I thought, I guess I can do this. It was a beautiful evening, so I decided to go for a walk. As soon as I got outside, I saw a tree. It was a huge, healthy, evergreen tree. I think it was a Douglas fir, 
and I'd passed this tree many times before, but hadn't really noticed it. This evening was different. The tree seemed to be calling to me. Notice me, notice me, it said. What could I do but stop and pay attention? Yes, I agree, I said silently. You are a beautiful tree. But as I stood taking in this tree, I saw something else. I realized that the tree wasn't only beautiful, it was kind of comical, funny. It wasn't one of those perfect Christmas trees that we sometimes imagine. It was kind of droopy in places, and it had branches that pointed every which way, and it absolutely dripped with green cones, more than we could count. And the more I looked at that tree, the more beautiful and the more comical it became. And I found myself laughing, a deep, joyful laugh from the belly. And I wasn't laughing at the tree. I was laughing with the tree. And I was, in a way, falling in love with it. You've heard of tree huggers? Well, that was me in that moment. The rest of my silent day went pretty much the same way. I walked all over and I saw beauty and joy everywhere. I saw it in the sky blue pink sunset that night. I saw it the next morning in the huge flowers in the rose garden. And I saw it in the big orange goldfish the koi in the Japanese garden. But the very best part came at the end. I was sitting outside having supper when three big black birds, they were crows, caught my eye. And these crows had found a treasure. It was a half-eaten box of onion rings. And these crows were fighting over it. But Maybe they were only pretending to fight. As I watched, I realized it seemed as though they'd invented a game to play. Crows are very smart, after all. One of them would snatch an onion ring in its bill, and another one would chase it, making a whole lot of noise. Can you caw like a crow? Caw, caw, caw! Finally, the first crow would drop the treasure and the second one would snatch it, and then the third one would chase the second crow. I think these crows eventually ate the onion rings, but not before they'd had a lot of fun with them. Before this retreat, I had been working much too hard and not getting enough sleep. I came to the retreat very, very tired. But seeing those crows playing, and seeing the tree and the sky and the koi and the roses was very healing. I started to feel rested and happy again. A long grown up word for that is to say that I felt rejuvenated. Rejuvenated, in other words, I started to feel young again. And I realized something that you children already know but we grown-ups often forget, and that is that play is at the heart of life. Work is important, but playing is important too. May all of you, whatever age, find some time to play this summer. May you make room in your life for joy and laughter and frolicking. Remember, this world is a gift given to us to enjoy. So may we rejoice and be glad in it.
I have two readings this morning. The first one is from the writings of E.B. White, and it's very short. I arise in the morning, torn between the desire to improve the world and a desire to enjoy the world. This makes it hard to plan the day. So that's E.B. White. And now here's Adrienne Marie Brown, a Black feminist activist and scholar who's based in Detroit. Her most recent book is entitled Pleasure Activism, and here's a brief passage from that. Pleasure reminds us to enjoy being alive and on purpose. Pleasure, embodied, connected pleasure, is one of the ways we know when we are free that we are always free, that we always have the power to co-create the world. Pleasure helps us move through the times that are unfair, through grief and loneliness, through the terror of genocide, or days when the demands are just overwhelming. Pleasure heals the places where our hearts and spirits get wounded. Pleasure reminds us that even in the dark, we are alive. Pleasure is a medicine for the suffering that is absolutely promised in life. Pleasure is the point. Feeling good is not frivolous. It is freedom.
I arise in the morning, torn between the desire to improve the world and a desire to enjoy the world. This makes it hard to plan the day. In these few words, E.B. White captures some classic human questions. What shall we do with our lives? How shall we spend our days? Do we devote them to improving the world, working for justice, or do we simply kick back and enjoy? Dick Gilbert, a veteran UU minister, names the dilemma this way, to savor the world or to save it. To savor the world or to save it. This world of ours is full of such incredible beauty. It blesses us each day with its gifts. It calls us to celebration. But it's also broken, full of unbearable suffering. It pierces our heart. It stirs our conscience. The past few weeks have made us more acutely aware of this than usual, with the pandemic claiming over 100,000 lives in this country and over 400,000 worldwide, and as we lament other lives lost at the hands of police, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and others. To which do we respond, the beauty or the brokenness? For those of us leading lives of privilege, there's always the temptation to savor the beauty and shut out the rest. Speaking personally, I know I'm not exempt. As a middle-class white woman, I've benefited from white skin privilege all my life. I've taken for granted things like food on the table, a good education, and police protection. These days, I live in a modest but safe senior community with a gate that closes at night. In such a sheltered life, I can easily focus on my garden, my cat, my family, my friends, and not much else. But sooner or later, the world's suffering is going to demand our attention. If nothing else, a sheltered life gets boring after a while. Beauty grows our souls, to be sure. But in the long run, in order to thrive, our souls also need challenges and ethical demands. In the last few months, and especially the last few weeks, the world's pain has come crashing in. The confluence of events is staggering. The pandemic, the murder of George Floyd, the widespread protests in response, and the Trump administration's response to all of it. These are apocalyptic times, I found myself thinking the week before last. And then I tuned into your Sunday service last week and heard John Cullinan's fine reflection. The word apocalypse comes from two Greek words, apo, which is like the prefix un, and calypto, which means to cover or to hide. So the apocalypse is the uncovering, the lifting of the veil. It is the raw exposure of America's white supremacy, which has been embedded in our nation's soul since 1619, but too often denied by white people until now. Something dramatic has happened since George Floyd's death. A majority of Americans now support the protests, 74% in a poll last Tuesday. Some friends of mine report seeing Black Lives Matter signs on the lawns of Trump supporters they know, and the bestseller lists are heavy with books on Black history and anti-racism. It seems we've reached a turning point, but we shouldn't assume the things will change automatically from here on in. As political historian Heather Cox Richardson wrote last Sunday, the current protests are an outpouring of outrage, but while that outrage is clearly deep and powerful, it has yet to change the government itself. She goes on, reminding us of the November elections. 
what happens between now and then will determine whether the past two weeks are remembered as the breaking point that turned the course of American history or not. In other words, we are in this for the long haul. Transforming our nation can't be a sprint. It has to be a marathon. Or, to shift to a New Mexico gardening image, it can't be a quick downpour that pelts the ground and then runs off into the arroyo. It needs to be a slow, steady, lasting rain that soaks the ground and reaches deep to the roots. As the young Black novelist Jason Reynolds has written, this is the beginning of a journey of a lifetime. And as your own minister said last Sunday, we need to do the next small, smart thing and then to keep doing it. There are plenty of ideas for what can be done. The list of actions that people can take for racial justice keeps growing, 75 on one list at last count. An internet search will get you to those lists. So it occurs to me, if this is a long-haul journey, then maybe the saver or save dichotomy isn't really a dichotomy at all. Rather than having to land on one side or the other, perhaps there's a way through. Maybe Adrienne Marie Brown is on to something when she writes about pleasure activism, and when she says that pleasure is one of the ways we know when we are free that we always have the power to co-create the world. I've known social activists, perhaps you've known them too, who burn out from trying to improve the world. They're constantly pushing themselves to do good, and they never take time to feed their own souls. They risk becoming exhausted, depressed, cynical, or all three. At very least, they tend to lack a sense of humor. And the medicine for this might be to lighten up, to inject some pleasure into their lives, to incorporate some laughter, some joy. If we find ourselves in need of more joy, what can we do? I can think of at least three possible approaches, and they're not mutually exclusive. One is to incorporate joy breaks into our work every day. When we're too tired to keep working or when we hit a creative block, we give ourselves permission to take a time out and do something else. This might involve looking at birds or tending to our garden or watching the night sky. Or it might be tossing a ball around or playing music, or watching a comedy show. The possibilities are endless. There's a second approach, and it involves a small shift in attitude, a way to think differently about whatever work we are doing. For example, anti-racism work can be a source of joy, but it can also get really hard and discouraging and painful. We run up against roadblocks. We have our motives questioned by others, and we second-guess our own motives and commitments. A way to sidestep this is to think about the end goals of our work, the world we want to see. One noted anti-racism trainer asks people, doesn't it give you joy to think about a truly inclusive multiracial society. Focus on that when the work gets really hard. Still a third approach is to think about our calling in the world. Chances are it has something to do with our joy. When I was last in Los Alamos in 2018, I shared with you Frederick Beekner's definition of calling or vocation. It's the place where our deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. 
in addition to thinking about the world's needs, then we can think about our own talents, the things we love to do most, the things that give us joy. How can they be turned into an offering, a gift to the world? Here's a story about that. When the great Spanish cellist Pablo Casals was in his 20s, he was already a celebrated musician. But then he had a crisis. Looking at the world around him with its violence and injustice, he was plunged into despair. How could he continue to play the cello in the midst of so much suffering? Wasn't that self-indulgent? But eventually, Casals had an insight. True, his music couldn't be an end in itself, but that didn't mean he should abandon it. He just needed to think about it differently. He had to make it, in his words, part of humanity. After that, for the rest of his life, Casals knew that music was his special calling. To see people gathered in a concert hall came to have a special significance for me. When I looked into their faces and when we shared the beauty of music, I knew that we were siblings, all members of the same family. May each of us tap the deep wellsprings of joy within ourselves. And may this joy be a blessing to us, our friends and family, and to the wider community. And may it fuel our work toward a more just and compassionate world, the vision of a world made fair with all its people one. Here in this religious community, we receive gifts that nurture body, mind, and spirit. Our offering is an opportunity to share some of what we have with the wider world. Even though we are unable to meet in person, we continue to take an online offering each week to support our community partners. During the month of June, in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, we invite you to contribute to one of the many organizations around the country working for racial justice. The link in the service notes and on your screen gives many options. We invite you to choose one or more and help move us toward the world we want to create. Thank you for your generosity. May what you give bring you joy.
May we hear the melody of life and find ourselves singing harmony. May we be open to the dissonances in the song of the land and its people. May we be part of the world's urging toward justice, peace, and love. May we feel in our bones the rhythms of life and the land, and may we find ourselves dancing. Go in peace.